Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Pastor Danny here. Uh, just got back from uh, morning service and uh, fellowship afterwards. Great, great day uh, in God's presence. Uh, along the beach, thanks for the Lord is giving us good weather so we can keep meeting outside. Uh, great to meet some new people today and then also uh, just uh, reconnect with some others and encourage some people. So I pray that uh, this afternoon or this evening, whenever you listen to this or watch this, uh, you're also encouraged. So um, members and uh, folks, uh, friends and road attenders, and those of you who are on the um, uh, the church family email list, if you have that email, uh, you'll see there a little uh, short form of prayer for um, this afternoon. It's normally our evening service, uh, service of evening prayer, that we use a short uh, little form of prayer um, adapted from the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. So that this is this is similar to that, just a little bit shorter actually, uh, because we're not singing. Uh, together because we're not together. So um, let's read together from Scripture. Um, so the worship of the Triune God, first Sunday after uh, first Sunday after Epiphany, uh, January tenth. That's the liturgy that you want to have out in front of you. Um, if you don't have that, that's fine. I'm just going to be praying, to, uh, praying, and uh, reading some scriptures together. So let's first of all hear uh, this season of Epiphany, which is a season in which we commemorate, remember, or celebrate that the Son of God in human flesh, Christmas, that that uh, manifestation of the Son of God in human flesh has come to the Gentiles, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, to Israel and the world. And so we, um, uh, as here we are, uh, I'm in Oceanside, California, United States of America, about as far as you can get from the promised land of the Israelites. So God has brought his gospel uh, to the ends of the earth. Uh, prophet, the prophecy of Isaiah 60 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising, and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Praise God for the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. Praise God that he's given us salvation. He's revealed himself to us. Let's bring him praise this afternoon. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Let's pray together uh, through Psalm number 136. We normally uh, either read psalms responsibly or sing them, and we've been reading and singing through, praying through the Psalter, together. So this afternoon, just one psalm um, for the sake of shortness, uh, Psalm 136, in which you'll find this wonderful refrain, um, his steadfast love endures forever. That steadfast love, chesed, is the Hebrew term. Uh, we translate it as faithfulness, um, steadfast love, his mercy. I think the old King James says his mercy. Uh, it means that God has made promises and he keeps them. His steadfast love is his keeping of his covenant promises. So the psalmist says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for a steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for a steadfast love endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for a steadfast love endures forever, but overthrow, overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for a steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for a steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever, and killed mighty kings, 
for a steadfast love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for a steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for a steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for a steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for a steadfast love endures forever. It is he who rem remembered us in our low estate, for a steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. This God of gods, this Lord of lords, is our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let's praise him together by saying the Gloria Patri, that ancient Christian hymn, uh, which Christians have used for two millennia to summarize and to express that the God of the Scriptures, uh, the God of the Old Testament, is the God who's revealed himself fully in the new as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together uh, this afternoon, this prayer for the first Sunday after Epiphany, and then we'll pray a couple other brief prayers as well before we uh, join our hearts in a prayer of thanksgiving. O Lord, we beseech you mercifully to receive the prayers of your people who call upon you. Grant that we may both perceive and know what things we ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfill them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, and all of God's people say, Amen. Let's pray for peace. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended by you from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior, and all of God's people say, Amen. Let's also pray for aid against all perils, Enlighten our darkness, we beseech you, O Lord, and by your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and all of God's people say, Amen. Let's pray briefly, interceding for the various needs that we as a congregation have, as well as uh, the burdens and sighs and cares that we have upon our hearts. Heavenly Father, we come to you through your Son, Jesus, relying upon the Holy Spirit this afternoon. We thank and praise you for this morning that we get to meet the Lord again. We get to hear the word. We get to sing the word, pray the word, uh, receive the visible word, the Lord's Supper. We pray, Lord, that we got to, uh, we thank you, Lord, that we got to fellowship together as brothers and sisters uh, and to welcome uh, those who are new to us. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would send your word into, their, into everyone's hearts, especially those who uh, may not know you yet or may not be fully committed to Jesus, that your word would uh, deeply, deeply uh, implant itself uh, upon the soil of their hearts. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon our elders. Pray for our brother Dennis, brother Duncan, brother Danny. Uh, refresh them, Lord, in their service. We pray for our deacons, our brother Alex, uh, brother John, and brother uh, Ed. Refresh them, Lord, and uh, equip us all together to serve you, uh, to build up our church family, Lord, in love and good deeds. We pray for your blessing upon uh, all those who uh, are, are uh, desirous to become part of our church family officially, we look forward to receiving uh, the Dill family and baptizing their daughters. We look forward to uh, receiving the Cerna family uh, and also receiving their little ones as well, their, their children. We, we pray, Father, for your blessing upon our lives. Uh, help us, Lord, as we're seeking to... Uh, to live in this uh, difficult, trying time, time of pressure and just uncertainty. Give us grace, Lord, to be kind and compassionate and faithful and thankful, patient, Lord, with, uh, with, with, with you, uh, with your works, Lord, that are mysterious to us, but also, Lord, with those who rule over us, with our neighbors. Father, there's so much division, so much hatred, so much chaos um, in, our, in our nation. Uh, we see it. We know all about it. Lord, even in our own church family, we have uh, differences of opinion, Lord, on politics, parties, platforms, ideologies. But we know that you are king. I pray that our church family will be united in the things of God, Jesus. And Lord, where your word speaks, give us clarity to speak it and uh, faith to receive it. Where your word is silent, Lord, help us to be silent. 
Uh, help us not to impose burdens upon one another uh, that your word does not impose upon. And so, Lord, help us to be a people uh, that are that are living peaceable, peaceably and quietly, as uh, 1 Timothy 2 says, as Paul tells Timothy, that we'd be peaceable and quiet in the sight of all men, so that, uh, Lord, that we would be uh, a good witness to those around us. And we, we pray, Father, that we would speak the gospel. We heard this morning that we would, like the apostles, as we're sent out, Lord, that we would rely wholly upon Jesus and his word to us. Give us confidence and conviction to testify of him by using your word. Uh, Lord, not falling back into our little uh, ruts of politics and uh, the ideologies, the platforms, the media, all the noise that's around us, Lord. These are all narratives. Uh, these are all gospel narratives, Lord, of various gospel political, um, national things, Lord. Help us to be focused as your kingdom upon a world that has no end and upon a kingdom that cannot be shaken so that people would see that and be drawn and attracted to the light that is found in Jesus Christ. Father, bless and protect us, we pray this week. Help us, Lord, uh, in, our, in our struggles at work and with our family and all the juggling that we're doing. Keep us healthy, we pray. Lord, give us godliness in our relationships and in our work. Uh, and all that we do, Lord, to be witnesses of your amazing grace. Forgive us, Father, for our many doubts, our many struggles of faith. Lord, we believe. Help thou our unbelief. We pray, Lord, uh, any prayers that we, own, that we have in our own personal hearts, in our own personal minds, in our own, our own personal struggles, that you would uh, take them to yourself at this time. Make them your own. Lord, relieve us of the burden. Hear us and answer us, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, Amen. Let's also pray... Uh, the prayer of thanksgiving that we use on Sunday evenings, and this, in this case, Sunday afternoon, the general thanksgiving, with our lips and especially with our hearts, praying and saying, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, do give you most humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech you, give us that due sense of all your mercies, that our hearts may be sincerely thankful, and that we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's turn together uh, for a few moments this afternoon uh, to reflect upon the scriptures, the Word of God. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can turn with me uh, to a, just a very brief passage uh, to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Uh, these verses will illustrate for us, uh, put forth in front of us, uh, the big idea, the big theme that we want to think about this afternoon, which is our faith, but also God's sacraments. And I'll try to make that connection between those two, our faith and God's sacraments in just a moment. So Peter says this in 1 Peter 1, let's pick up at verse 22. Uh, he reminds the, uh, the ancient Christians in what is today modern day Turkey, uh, in that time it would have been Asia, he says, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. What a, what a great e exhortation to us, uh, as I just prayed, and as we're all thinking about what's going on in our nation, uh, that we as Christians uh, would have a sincere brotherly love, uh, to love each other earnestly, which is the mark, Jesus says, to the world that God has sent his son. Let's love one another from a pure heart. Since, right? So here, here's the why then. Here's, here's why uh, we ought to do that. Since you have been born again. Jesus says in John 3, you must be born again. Peter says, you have been born again. You have been born again. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For, he quotes now from Isaiah 40, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains 
forever. And then Peter ex explains that. And this word is the good news, the gospel that was preached to you. Amen. Well, this afternoon, I want to think with you about our faith and God's sacraments. Our faith and God's sacrament. Just for a few moments, we have been using the Heidelberg Catechism uh, in our afternoon second service, uh, evening service, uh, to help us to reflect upon the, the basics, the ABCs, the one, two, threes of our Christian faith. And it's so important for you and for me uh, to understand what our faith is. I don't mean the faith, meaning the Christian message or theology, but our faith. What is our faith? Um, it's important for us to know how our faith, how, how, how we exercise our faith. Uh, a faith that reaches hold, grabs hold, receives, rests in all that Christ has done. Uh, it, it makes it ours, our own. Now, the, the reason why I bring that up is because, because it's a danger for us to think of faith, uh, even as a sermon title, our faith, as a work. A thing that we do, right? Christ has done what he's done, and now we do what we do. And like those two things kind of come together and bring us to salvation. We need to know where faith comes from. We need to know uh, not just where it comes from, but when it feels like it's left us. What do we do? Where can we find help? Where do we turn? What aids has God given to us? And so I want to think with you about Lord's Day 25 this afternoon. Uh, the Heidelberg Catechism. It's on the sermon notes page on the attachments uh, to our weekly email. Uh, but if you have a copy of the Heidelberg Catechism, or you can just quickly uh, search up three forms, T H R E F O R M S, threeforms.org, you'll find the words of the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, Lord's Day 25. So that's QA, questions and answers 65 uh, through 68. So I want you to see, first of all, this afternoon with me, just for a few moments, the source of our faith. The source of our faith. So our catechism has been explaining and expressing to us uh, the Apostles' Creed and the benefit of that, of believing all that, is that we by faith alone are justified. We are righteous. We are acceptable before God. We receive all the benefits of Christ by faith. So the source of that faith, that's the big question for us. And uh, Q&A 65 says, It is by faith alone that we share in Christ and all his benefits. Where then does that faith come from? Where then does that faith come from? The answer says the Holy Spirit works it in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel and confirms it by the use of the Holy Sacrament. So where does your and my faith come from? It comes from God. It comes from, in particular, the Holy Spirit uh, because we have been born again, as we just read from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that we've been born again. We've been given new life. We've been regenerated, born again to new life. And uh, the Spirit of God is, uh, is said to, uh, to reveal, to give us understanding. Paul says in 1, Peter, uh, in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that the deep, hidden, mysterious truths of God, which rulers and kings and, and wise men in the world cannot grasp and understand, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. You've been born again. God has revealed His truth through the Spirit. Uh, and Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that uh, we are saved by grace, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Where does my faith come from that receives Christ and all his benefits? It comes by, comes from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, we are told here so wonderfully, as, um, as, as we have been born again, as Peter tells us, he works it. Our English text of the Heidelberg Catechism Q&A 65 says the Holy Spirit works it in our hearts. The German text says this, it, uh, that it uh, is, is, is worked or it's produced. Wirkt is the, uh, is the, uh, the verb here. It's, it's worked or it is um, produced in our hearts. The Latin text gives us this really interesting illustration, not just that it's worked or produced, uh, but when it says uh, the Holy Spirit uh, works it in our hearts, Accendit is the Latin verb here. Uh, it means to kindle or to set something on fire or to, to light it on fire. The Spirit of God lights a fire, as it were, in our hearts. That fire is faith, which we are then, by it, uh, he enlightens us, he kindles it in our hearts, 
uh, he produces it and so forth, we are then able to receive Jesus Christ. So where does his faith come from? It comes by the Holy Spirit. He works it in our hearts, meaning our the deepest part of our recesses of our soul, by, by, notice that language of by or through, uh, the preaching of the Holy Gospel. Doesn't Paul tell us in Romans chapter number 10 that faith comes by hearing, right? Hearing by the word of Christ. Our text again in 1 Peter chapter number 1 tells us this very thing. Where does our faith come from? Uh, it comes from God, uh, the Holy Spirit, who produces it. He, in, he kindles it. He sets it on fire, as it were, uh, in our hearts. When he tells us that we've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed. That's the parable of the sowers from uh, Matthew 13. The parable of the sower, where the gospel is proclaimed, the word of God is spoken, it's like seed upon various soils. But the seed that gives us new life is not perishable, but imperishable. And Peter says it's, the, it's through the living and abiding word of God. What is that living and abiding word of God that's imperishable? The gospel, verse 25, the gospel, the good news, that was preached to you. Like I, I said this morning, I'll say it again, there are lots of gospels out there right now. Uh, there are lots of um, supposed narratives, supposed truths that you can find online. Uh, trying to give people a sense of what the world, what's happening in the world. And each and every one of these narratives, they're false gospels. They're, they're trying to sway us into a certain action by telling us the world is a certain way that it really is. The only imperishable seed, the only imperishable uh, lasting gospel narrative story uh, worldview is the word of God, is the gospel that comes to us as it is proclaimed to us by the very mouth of, 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 a, of, a, of a Holy Spirit inspired, uh, uh, endued, called, equipped minister of the gospel who proclaims to us the very word of God. It's the gospel proclaimed to us that God loves us and has forgiven us, that Jesus is king, that he works all things for good and so forth. This is the gospel that's imperishable in our hearts. Through it, God inflames faith so that we might reach forth and grab Christ. Uh, whatever your per political persuasion is today, you know, again, the media, all the sides of the media, all the angles and so forth, uh, all the YouTube videos that you can watch, uh, all the websites you can go to, all the news shows, the talking heads at night and so forth, they are all giving, in some respects, part of, you know, reality, but they're giving a narrative uh, that ultimately is perishable. That's the point, that it's perishable. The only imperishable seed is the gospel. So where does my faith come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. Through the preaching of the gospel. Uh, and he confirms it by use of the holy sacraments. So that's the second thing I want you to focus on just for a moment or two, uh, a few moments or two. Uh, the help of the sacraments, Q&A number 66. So what if my faith is weak, right? So we know that faith is a gift of God, but our experience and our exercise of that faith can oftentimes be weak, right? So if faith is described oftentimes in our old writers, faith is the hand that reaches forth and grabs Christ. But my hand sometimes is weak. My hand is weak. My grasp might, might not be as tight or as strong as it needs to be. So what if my faith is weak? So the Holy Spirit not only creates faith in our hearts, but he also confirms our faith. Q&A 66 asks, what are, the sac or what are sacraments? And it says, sacraments are visible holy signs and seals. They were instituted by God so that by our use of them, he might make us understand more clearly the promise of the gospel and seal that promise. And this is God's gospel promise. He grants us forgiveness of sins and eternal life, amazing, by grace, because of Christ's one sacrifice accomplished on the cross. Sacraments. So what if my faith is weak, right? So we have the word of God. We can hear it proclaimed from an authorized minister and so forth, and it comes to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. But my faith can still be weak. God knows this. He knows that we are like dust. He knows our frame. He knows that we are weak. 
And so he's given us tangible aids. He's given us sacraments. They are visible, holy signs and seals. This comes right from Scripture. This language of baptism and communion being signs and seals is right from our Bibles. Genesis 17 describes circumcision as a sign of the covenant. A sign of the covenant. There's the covenant and then there's a sign of the covenant. What does a sign do, kids? A sign that says stop it's, it's pointing to something else, right? There's a place in an in a, in a imaginary line that you've got to stop behind, right? A sign that says rest stop. The sign isn't the rest, but it's the place that you go to and you pull your car over if you get tired on the side of the road, or the freeway at night, take a little, a little cat nap or get out and stretch and so forth, right? So there's the promise, the covenant, and there's the sign of the covenant. Uh, and that's why uh, in the Old Testament, God tells Moses, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter number 30, uh, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart because the sign of circumcision was just the sign. But it's God who gives the reality, the covenant, the promise of that sign. Uh, when my faith is weak, then there are signs that point beyond themselves to Christ, point me beyond myself to Christ. And they're also called seals. They are seals. Paul tells us in Romans 11, uh, 4, verse 11, uh, that when Abraham, uh, he believed, and it was accounted to him as righteousness, and then he was commanded to be to circumcise his children and himself, that circumcision was a seal of the righteousness that he already had by faith. So in the Old Testament, in the ancient world, even today, uh, we have seals. So a, re a, a ring on a king's finger had a little symbol on it, right? It represented himself, or a word, or his name. And they would take wax, they would melt it on an official document, and they would impress that finger, that ring, that signet, that sign, on that wax to show it came from King David. This comes to us from our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. The baptism and communion are seals. They are seals. They are authentic. They are real. They are true. Uh, so often we go inward, don't we? Right? When my... When my when the grasp of my faith is weak and it feels like I'm losing hold of Christ, we so often go to ourselves. You know, well, you know, I'm not doing, I'm not squeezing hard enough. Well, it's because I didn't pray hard enough. I didn't read the Bible for long enough. Uh, I didn't witness to enough people. I didn't go to church. Uh, I missed church on a Sunday. Or I looked at something or someone that I shouldn't have in a, in a, in a lustful way. I said the wrong thing. I was hurtful to someone. I didn't care for someone. I, I took something that didn't belong to me. I wanted to take something that didn't belong to me. We go inward to ourselves. We think, you know, if I can just really clean up my act and get my heart right with God, you know, then I would feel that sort of that mountain high, that spiritual experience of, you know, really believing in Jesus. The sacraments tell us it's not in you, it's in Christ. That you find your assurance, your hope, your confidence. They are signs that point beyond themselves. They are seals to confirm to you. That's one big difference, uh, isn't it, for, for us uh, in the historic Christian uh, Protestant Reformed tradition, right? The, those of us who identify ourselves you know, mentally and even in our words, and we seek to do this in our worship and our preaching and our lifestyle, uh, to live an authentic Christian life, a Catholic, small c, an ancient Christian, an historic Christian lifestyle, and to, to have an historic Christian faith. Sacraments that are outside of you, that point you to Christ, that gives you assurance. That's way different than the kinds of Christian spiritualities and pieties and so forth that, that many of us have grown up in. right? So it, when we ask the question of, you know, what do I do when my faith seems weak? The answer is, it's not about you, it's about Christ. And so for us in the Reformed tradition, we say, well, that's why we assemble. That's why we must come together as a church to hear the word proclaimed, to receive the sacraments to see them, to hold them, to touch them around other sinners, you know, uh, looking at a brother who's struggling in faith and to know that I have similar struggles or to see him in his struggles say, you know, where else am I going to go, Lord, to you? Uh, you alone have the words of everlasting life. That's, a, that's an encouragement to me. It's, he's outside of me, right? So we come together and we see that each of us, even though we might be strong, we might be weak, we are partaking of this one loaf, this one cup, this bread, this wine, that testifies to us that together we are found in Christ. In Christ. So where do I go? I go to the sacraments. Because they are God's visible signs and seals. I just mentioned, and I'll just say it again quickly, you see in the outline there, the third point is 
the substance of sacraments, that's Q&A 67, are both the word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, on the cross of the only ground of our salvation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, indeed, the answer says. The Holy Spirit teaches us in the gospel and confirms by the holy sacraments that our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. When we see baptism, and, if, and Lord willing, in the next couple of Sundays, we'll see some baptisms as a congregation. It's not just a moment to see the cute children, uh, the clothes they're wearing, right? Might pass on a baptismal gown at times. Uh, it's, not a, it's not just a time for us to, you know, think this is a great little sign, little ceremony. It's for all of us to reaffirm not just our faith, but to be reaffirmed, to be assured. As God says to even to little ones, you are mine. You are mine. And then we hear God say to us once again, you are mine, no matter how old you are. You are mine. The word preached, the sacraments administered, are intended to focus our faith on the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And again, to point back to what I said this morning, if you weren't there, uh, that's fine. Uh, just just uh, scroll down on YouTube here. You know, the, the video, uh, Sunday morning, January 10th, uh, the title is Jesus and Unbelief. I mentioned, again, all the narratives, all the false gospels, all the media stuff, all the hype, all the ups and downs of our nation, all the sins of our nation, and so forth, all the blessings and the curses of our nation, all the stuff that's going on today. You know, it's all meant to focus us on these narratives and, and, and so forth, backwards and forwards and history and, and, and what's going to happen and so forth. The sacraments, when we come together to receive the sacraments, they are intended to focus our faith collectively on Jesus Christ, no matter if you're Republican or Democrat, independent, uh, libertarian, progressive, conservative, moderate, no matter what you call yourself, however you identify yourself, in this world, in this kingdom uh, uh, political system, the sacraments bring us together to focus our faith together on the one sacrifice of Christ for all of us, the one sacrifice of Christ for all of us in our salvation. How many sacraments are there, finally? How many sacraments did Christ institute in the New Testament? Q&A 68.2. Holy Baptism and the Holy Supper. Very simple, isn't it? Very simple. Why? Why only two? Because that's all Christ gave us. How do we know that? We read the Gospel stories. He's given us two great signs. Two great sacraments, three signs. There's water and baptism, there's bread and wine, the Lord's Supper. But these two great sacraments, and he's given a promise with them both. Go into the world and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the first sacrament. And he's also given us the Lord's Supper. He took that bread, he took that cup, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it, and said, this is my body, this is my blood. That's the promise. The bread and wine are the signs, the seals. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, loved ones, my friends, uh, again, you know, these are things that we that we see here every Sunday in our church. Uh, we have preaching and sacraments every single Sunday. Uh, we have our supper and Sunday morning service. We can take for granted these things, but they're so and so important. And especially, you know, in the time in which we're living, these are so important to unite us in what really unites us: Jesus Christ. Uh, and in our church family, as you know, again, uh, and whether you realize it or not. Uh, we have many different political parties, many different people that we voted for this past election. Uh, you, you can look around and it's obvious and it's a blessing to our church. Uh, people uh, from different countries who speak different languages, who uh, are of different colors, different cultures. But we come together as a church family. Uh, we're a family. We receive our family. We love our family. And we come and say, you know... I didn't vote the same way as you, you know. Uh, I'm not excited about this next president, or you know, I'm excited about this this our current president no longer being the president. We might think those things, but we say, you know what? But what matters is Jesus ultimately. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we join together. We come to hear the word at the feet of Jesus, and we come around uh, when we are meeting inside, at least around the table of the Lord. Right? We all come up and receive around that table the bread and wine. This is what unites us, brothers and sisters. This is what I'm excited about as a pastor of, of this church and to be your pastor. 
uh, is that we are we are committed to not just these wonderful truths of the, uh, doctrinal theological truths, but they are very practical to you and to me. Whether you are old in the, in the Reformed tradition or you are brand new to it, uh, whether you are white, whether you are black, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're Asian, whatever culture you come from, whether whatever party you belong to, what you do as a job, uh, what your thoughts are about what's going on, you know, the things that we that we are joined to, uh, the thing is Jesus. And the word and sacraments point us to him together. Amen. That's that's what's exciting to me about our church. And uh, continue to pray for us that we would grow in this and that we would see more, want to know this and, and, and see that. I pray that people would see that our church uh, with different uh, cultural uh, uh, backgrounds, different colors, different expressions of our of our culture, uh, even together, uh, different socioeconomic statuses and so forth. I'm excited to see people and pray for people to see that and say, wow, this is a place where God is present. Where else, where else can people be joined together in such a way and love each other and love each other? Having been born again, again, Peter tells us, having been born again, right? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, love one another, love one another. Let's do that. Let's uh, come together again next Lord's Day, Lord willing, to hear the gospel uh, and to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, Bless our uh, reading of your word and our meditation this afternoon. Encourage our hearts as a church family to continue to grow in the truth and to continue to grow in the application of that truth, Lord. We do pray for our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones and our co-workers and all those that we come into contact with, Lord, uh, especially in this time. Use us as a body of Christ, Lord, to, uh, to be an encouragement to the world around us. May we be, the ch- be a church uh, that truly, Lord, expresses what your word says to be a people and to be a place uh, where the lost can be found, uh, the hurting can be healed, the broken can be put back together, the lonely find a friend. Father, uh, the, the, the disparate ideas can be set aside and we can join together in Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us um, for thinking otherwise. Help us, Lord, in this, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, Amen. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you, may he make his face to shine upon you, may he make his countenance to be lifted up upon you, may God's face look upon you today and going out into this week. May God bless.